It's Friday night in the A, and you know what that means. Kelly Price and Tori McElhaney coming at you on Rise Up Tonight. Presented by AT&T. TGIF Atlanta, we are thankful for the weekend, even if we're not necessarily thankful for what the Falcons did on Sunday. Yeah, you know, both games, th both things can be accurate at the same time. You can be <laughs> thankful for both or not thankful for one. <laughs> well, Atlanta held an opponent to fewer than 200 total yards from scrimmage for the first time this season. Defense also notched five sacks for the first time since 2020. Eight different Falcons caught passes and the offensive production was more than double Washington's and yet the Falcons lost the game. Let's unpack all of that. Time now to huddle up y'all. Let's huddle up with Kelly and Tori on the world of Falcons football. The Falcons offense put up 402 total net yards, eclipsing the 400 yard mark for the third time this season and second straight week. But the balance there was about one fourth rushing yards, three fourths passing yards. What has happened to the Falcons ground game that we kind of know and love? Here's the thing. If you, if you listen to opposing defenders since the Detroit game, you'll hear many of them say the exact same thing. We are going to sell out to stop the run. That means loading the box with defenders. Go back to the Texans game, actually, and even though the Falcons won that game, they faced a blocking disadvantage based on the number of defenders in the box and just over half of their total carries in that game. What we are seeing happening this year is teams are daring Atlanta to beat them through the air. So Atlanta just suffered its first home loss uh, on Sunday. But what's wild is the Falcons haven't won a game on the road in more than a year. Yeah, that's wild. Eight straight road L's. The only game away from Mercedes-Benz Stadium that they've won since the 2021 season was last September at Seattle in week three. I mean, what do you make of that? It's hard because with the Falcons, they've got to be better on the road. And, and that's what I mean, that's what needs to happen. But seriously, I don't know what to make of that stat. And I don't know how to <laughs> fix it. But I think I think we, we all know that it needs to be fixed, and maybe at this point it's a little mental too, but whatever the case may be, the Falcons have got to find some way to break through that glass ceiling because this may be their toughest test to date, going down to Tampa to face a key divisional opponent this weekend, and a guy like Vita Vea isn't going to make that easy on them. Right. I don't think I need to remind anyone that the Falcons lost the turnover battle again. Their turnover mar margin is minus six on the season. And by the way, here comes a Tampa Bay team that is plus six, having forced 10 turnovers, only committing four in their five games. The Falcons, as a reminder, are at 10 giveaways, six picks, four fumbles. How do you explain this trend and how can they remedy it? Yeah, so this thing goes both ways. I know we praise this defensive lot for how clutch they are, and yes, that's warranted praise, but an area they need to improve upon is accumulating takeaways. As I said last week, Jesse Bates III is the only defender with a turnover to his name this year. The defense just needs more in that area. But then there's the offense, and this is a unit that has to take care of the ball. Remember at the top of the show that you pointed out how wild it was that this offense had the amount of production it did and still lost? Well, it's because of those turnovers in the second half. If it does, it doesn't matter if you drive down 70 yards. If you turn it over in the end zone, that yeah. production is kind of a moot point. Yeah. Well, one area of growth that we've been seeing week after week is the pregame fits department. We are walking in presented by Wells Fargo. Let's start here. Richie Grant having a full on photo shoot in the Mercedes Benz mm -hmm. Stadium parking lot. My favorite part is he never appears to actually take the jacket off of his shoulder. It is merely an accessory to achieve the desired vibe. Sometimes that's all you need, though. You don't need anything <laughs> more, anything less. This is a really nice fit for Richie. I love it. Next up, Bajan Robinson serving us a fall moment. It is simple. It is clean and he makes this fit look effortless, just like he kind of does with everything on the football field. Oh man, look at that walk and the smolder. He's got it going. <laughs> Okay, Bajan. And he's waving to somebody. I don't, I don't know if there's anyone actually there. All right. Our loyalist viewers will notice we have not talked much about our boy Tyler Algier mm -hmm. as much as we normally do on Rise Up Tonight. And trust me, no one is more upset about that development than Tori. Than I. Yeah. But we had to include him on Walking In, which is now that I'm starting to think about it. Very similar to Bajan's look here. I'm mostly obsessed with the neutral tone dunks that he's got on and how he paired them with another clean, simple fall fit. You know we love a flannel around here and the fact that the shoes match kind of the, the flannel. I'm, I'm really here for this. I'm here for that. Finally, we will leave you with our boy Jeff Akuda, who is killing it in the pregame department, pregame fit department. As much as we love the matching set, these kicks, they are absolutely uh, everything mm -hmm. to me. Clearly a big week for the Falcons collective shoe game here, Tori. Also, I don't know if you saw his necklace, but the Jeff necklace yes. is really nice, a nice fit too. Yes, I like that as well. Good touch. <laughs> 
All right, those Falcons made all the right choices when picking out their walk-in and fits, but tonight we're asking the Dirty Birds which teammate thinks he is always right in our question of the week. One teammate. <laughs> I'm going to go with Drew Dahlman, our center, because he's he's quite the intellectual. I'm going to go with my dog, uh, Nate Lamon. Matt Collins. Uh, I would say, I have to say Liam. AK. AK swears he's always right with everything. Oh, you got to go with Chris Lindstrom. Got to go with Chris. I wouldn't have expected that. He's so, he's so soft-spoken with that Yeah, style. he is. He is. <laughs> but, you know, that's times where Enough. that's all it is. True. Dies on every hill. Probably Kaleas. <laughs> <laughs> One day you just want somebody just to just to vent to or something, but he like, man, but you know what? You gotta look at it like this. You gotta look at it like this. You know, but you know what you need that. You know what I'm saying? But I was like, sometimes I'm like, bro, you know what? Never mind, bro. <laughs> you got it. You're right. Why am I not surprised you can't vent to Calais without him trying to turn it into a positive? Yeah, and having <laughs> spoken to a lot of these guys in this locker room, I would pick AK. He's yes. always coming up with some Penn State hot take. And it, like, is not never right. It's No. <laughs> and he's dying on that hill. So that's I agree with that one for sure. All right, still to come, she is the queen of Atlanta's food and things to do scene. The woman behind ATL Bucket List Instagram account joins us later in the show. And stay tuned for a story about how the Falcons gave back to 10 women whose lives have been forever changed by a breast cancer diagnosis. That's next on Rise Up Tonight. Rise Up Tonight is presented by AT&T and brought to you by the Georgia Lottery. Today could be the day. The Home Depot, how doers get more done. Mercedes-Benz, the best of nothing. And truest, when you start with care, you get a different kind of bank. It's time to Rise Up Atlanta. Kelly and Tori are back on your home for Falcons football. Fox 5 Atlanta. October isn't just spooky season. It's also about breast cancer awareness and honoring women whose lives have been affected by it. The Falcons treated 10 lovely ladies to a day full of pampering, topped off with a dinner served by players who each had some connection with the fight against cancer. Our Georgia Chambers has more as we rise up for Atlanta, brought to you by Truist. So many amazing, uh, beautiful women in there who are fighters and uh, just how strong they are and hearing their different stories is uh, truly remarkable. Sheila Putamano was one of 10 survivors and fighters celebrated by the Falcons for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. You hear cancer, you see a casket. But then after that, I you know woke up and as I had to tell my daughter, but I, had, I went through all the procedures before I told her. Putamana was diagnosed with breast cancer a week after her 75th birthday in June of 2022. Shortly after, she had surgery. Then came chemotherapy and radiation. It was a long, drawn out um, 15 months and then the doctor threw at me oral chemo. This roller coaster finally came to a stop last month. We were in the car when the uh, surgeon called and I was like really scared, you know, when I heard the message said, this is Dr. Fernandez. And I just, you know, lost my, the air for a minute. And she said, yeah, we got everything, everything is clear. Putumana never lost her positive outlook on life and encourages those battling cancer to do the same. I did it, you know, I mean, it's doable. I mean, it's nothing that I would, you know, say it's a piece of cake or anything like that. But it's doable. Just deal with it. You know, there's nothing you can do about it and just march on. Georgia Chambers, rise up tonight. Awesome. Thanks so much, Georgia. Well, it seems like every time the Falcons take a step forward this season, they followed up with a bunch of steps backwards. We saw it this week again, flailing in the fourth quarter, which is pretty much the opposite of all these kind of clutch second half performances right. we've been seeing from them in 2023. But as you wrote in your AtlantaFalcons.com notebook this week, the middle eight minutes of the game were really critical in this loss. Yeah, I know that a lot of people are going to talk about this fourth quarter, but let's talk about the middle eight for a second. It's the last four minutes of the first half and the first four minutes of the second half. And against the commanders this past week, the Falcons offense had chance after chance to score in the final minutes of that first half, but failed to. And then when they get the opportunity to get points on the board to start the second half, Desmond Ritter throws an interception. Not producing in those moments kept the Falcons fighting from behind, and it, it's what got you to that fourth quarter when you felt things get a little frazzled. They have to be better in those middle eight moving forward. 
The middle eight, definitely an area of growth for the Falcons going forward. But what are some other trends we might see snapped and storylines to watch in Tampa Bay? Tori and I have some opinions later on during Hot Takes. Plus, we're in the nest with the woman who 336,000 of us trust when it comes to fun food and things to do in the ATL. It's almost game time, Falcons fans. When the Falcons sack the opposing QB at home, you'll score a BOGO free Big Zach snack meal the day after the game. Valid online only at Atlanta area stores. Welcome back to Rise Up Tonight. Let's head in the nest with Kelly, Tori, and this week's special guest. Brought to you by Mercedes Benz. So excited to bring Alyssa Fagan in the nest with us here tonight. We, you guys probably better know her as ATL Bucket List on Instagram. You talk about all kinds of restaurants, events, all kinds of fun things to do around Atlanta. I want to know how this kind of started for you. How did ATL Bucket List start? Yeah, you know, it's crazy to think it's been almost nine years since I first started this Instagram account. Um, I am not an Atlanta native. Um, I'm originally from Florida. So when I moved here about nine years ago, I was blown away by everything that was happening in Atlanta. And you have to remember, it was 2014. So this was like the Beltline had just kind of opened. Pont City Market wasn't even open yet. Wow. So it was like a very pivotal time in Atlanta. And I think I really was just so inspired by everything. I worked a little bit in marketing and I was like, let's see what happens. You know, I want to start posting on Instagram. And I think the timing was really right in Atlanta, but also in the social media space where there weren't a ton of people doing it. And then here we are all these years later. Later. It's I crazy to think about Atlanta without Pont City Market in I know. 2023. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. It's become such a staple. You forget how things can become like staples so quickly, and I right. think that's a definite testament. Now, you talk about moving to Atlanta in 2014 and kind of seeing the city grow, but what initially intrigued you about the city of Atlanta and kind of initially made you fall in love with the city? Yeah, you know, <laughs> I hate to say a lot of it was um, like logistics. So being from Florida, I didn't want to be too far from family. I hate the cold. <laughs> So Same. I kind of like drew a line in the United States and was like, okay, I can't go more north than this. Um, I did have some friends who lived here and honestly, it took one visit. I remember going to Piedmont Park and I was just like, wow. In like the almost decade that you've lived here, you mentioned Ponce not even being a thing, mm -hmm. but how else have you seen this city change? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I can't not talk about the restaurant scene. Right. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, a lot of what I talk about on ATL Bucket List is food. I love food. Um, and I really think we're one of the like main players um, in food these days. We have so many great restaurants um, and I think people are really starting to recognize Atlanta as a culinary destination. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean the neighborhoods really have evolved. Um, I mean just like I think it is really cool how each neighborhood kind of has its own little charm and I feel like I think it's always been that way but I feel like as we've grown as a city that has certainly um, I don't know, it had more of, it created more of a persona in each of the different little neighborhoods. They, they like leaned into it. Yeah, like really I leaned agree. into the personality of each little parts of the city. And it's a neighborhood proud area. Like, yeah, like everyone's definitely. very proud of like the part of Atlanta yeah. that they live in. Yeah, and I mean, and talking about sports, like Atlanta United, like, I mean, seeing how um, the sports game has kind of evolved, we didn't even have a soccer team. Right. Um, so I think it's cool kind of seeing how Atlanta, I really think, is just such a booming city and clearly with all these different avenues we can see that that's true absolutely now the the account itself I feel like the the whole probably idea of it started out as just kind of like maybe just like a fun project for you to have and to you for you to do to help explore the city but when was the moment where you really started seeing it kind of explode a little bit and become something that people really gravitated towards mm -hmm. yeah um, I mean you you really nailed it um, I started this completely for fun um, and I was like oh you know I don't want to post all these food and adventure photos on my personal Instagram, you know, I have people who probably don't care what's happening in Atlanta <laughs> following me. Um, and I think it took honestly just a few months. I mean, again, remember, it was such a different time. There was no like Instagram algorithm and we didn't have stories. We didn't have reels. Like things were just so different um, that I was able to grow really fast. I think also, again, timing, there weren't a lot of people doing what I was doing. So like somebody would see the account and they'd be like, wow, this is something new and unique. Within seven months, I had hit like 
10,000 followers and that's when I realized, okay, like I think this might be a little bit more than just a side passion project. What do you think is the breakdown of people who live here that, you know, watch your stuff and engage with it versus people who want to visit here? And how has that maybe changed over the last couple of years? Like maybe more people who live here now that are engaging with your content. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. It's hard for me to say exactly. I know a vast, vast majority of my followers are based here in Atlanta, um, whether it's Atlanta um, or it's Marietta or Sandy Springs or any of the neighboring um, cities. That said, I was just looking at my analytics the other day and like one of my top cities, which again was a small percent because the biggest is Atlanta, was New York City. Interesting. Um, so I do think there are people in other cities that are interested in visiting Atlanta who do look to pages similar to ATL Bucket List to get inspired. Imagine someone's coming from in and out of town or maybe yeah. someone just moved here. What is like the number one thing you're like, you got to do this? So I guess this is going to sound probably overshared, um, but I do think you have to do the whole like East Side Beltline trail. Yeah. Um, like hit Pont City Market, walk down the Beltline. There's so many great restaurants. Um, grab a drink if that's your thing. You can bring your dog. Um, so I think that to me is kind of quintessential Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I think locals might tell a different story, uh, but I think if you're visiting or you're, you just really want to give someone the Atlanta experience, and that is a must. Now, this is a sports show. This is a Falcon <laughs> show. It is. We've talked about Atlanta United. Is there a specific sports bar or something that you would recommend to people that's like, hey, like this is a cool place to go to catch a game? Definitely. So, obviously, I love good food and good drinks. Yes. Um, as so, well do. yes. Who doesn't? It's a must. <laughs> yep. Yes. <laughs> um, so, I'm a huge fan of Hampton and Hudson. Mm, I think, like, alone, they do food and drink great. Um, and then when you know they have when there's any sort of game playing whether it's college or NFL or anything like that um, they're always playing the games I always have a great time thank you so much for joining us Alyssa thank we really thank appreciate you. it anyone who wants to catch the whole conversation head to fox5atlanta.com and we will be right back on rise up tonight hey Atlanta this is Ed Crack talking and you watching rise up tonight presented by AT&T Like, I don't get caught up in whatever narrative is after four weeks of the daily narratives. You can almost write some of these narratives and live and die every week by the narratives. I don't use that lingo. That's the sensational line. It's like the scene where the dude's chasing the guy down from Happy Gilmore. Run. Give away our scheme. What the hell is going on? Now you're really trying to put me on the hot seat here. Some narratives, narratives. <laughs> All right, so technically we were both correct last week with our hot takes. The Falcons defense did hold another opponent to less than 30 points, and the passing attack was prolific. Eight different Falcons catching passes, but it doesn't feel like a win when it isn't a win. No, it really doesn't, and, you know, we'll take it, <laughs> but also kind of we're a little upset about it too. All right, new week, new hot takes. We saw this defense level up with five sacks on Sunday. This Sunday in Tampa, it's time for them to level up again. Since Jesse Bates intercepted Jared Goff in week three, it's been 13 quarters since the Falcons forced a turnover. In that span, meanwhile, they've turned the ball over nine times. Talking to Jesse Bates in the locker room this week, he was like, creating a takeaway is this defense's number one focus this week, which I thought was interesting. I'm putting up what you're putting down, Jesse. So my hot take is that the Falcons will get a takeaway. They will end that takeaway drought this week in Tampa some way, somehow. Something they need to do. Okay, y'all. You had to know this hot take was coming. I've got <laughs> Grady Jarrett revenge game in Tampa Bay. Remember what happened last year in Tampa? Remember how the Falcons were fighting back and Grady Jarrett sacked Tom Brady to give the Falcons the ball back to try and go win the game? Remember how that sack was one of the most controversial penalties in the league last year, that roughing the pass passer penalty? I know you remember. I remember. I'm sure Grady de Jarrett does too. <laughs> so even though it's not Tom Brady in the pocket in Tampa anymore, watch out Baker Mayfield because I think Grady Jarrett is coming. Yeah, and speaking of the Tom Brady-less Bucks, Baker Mayfield has got them kind of rolling here. I mean, their run game is still a little bit to be desired, but they're still, you know, at the same record as the Falcons. Whoever wins this game could take control of the division. This really does feel like a must-win game for this team. I know we've talked about playing on the road and everything, but this is an NFC South opponent that the Falcons really need to beat. This is where things get started. This is where the, the competition really heats up for the NFC South, and this is a division that when you look at it, it sometimes comes down to one game here or there that decides it. Maybe the Falcons can bring back Cleveland, Baker Mayfield. All right, we'll wrap it up for you next week. Have a great night.